Hi there, and welcome to this rather unique event, Pest Extra, all online. Hope you're having fun today and finding your way around all the stalls well enough. Uh, I'm here today, however, to talk to you about rodent diseases and how they are transmitted. So, first things first, here's a little bit of an introduction for those that don't know me. My name is Alex Wade. I used to work for one of the UK's manufacturer of rodenticides and insecticides, and I was their uh, technical field efficacy manager. And what I used to do there is I used to test both existing and novel products, both in the lab and in the field. And so this has given me a unique perspective on how many, if not all, of the products we use today are used and their virtues and their deficits. But end of last year, I decided I was going to go my own way and I founded a company called Wade Environmental. So Wade Environmental is an independent pest management co uh, consultancy specialising in product testing and development, training and education, site surveys and auditing. Now that's not why we came here today, why you're having a listen to this is because you want to know about rats and fleas, what spread diseases, and we're going to break today's talk into four major sections. Firstly, we're going to decide what it is that makes these animals pests. When does a rat become a pest? When in fact is it just simply a part of the ecosystem? We're going to have a look then at some of the diseases that these animals carry and what makes these diseases tick, how diseases move from host to host within the environment. And then we're going to have a look a bit more at some of the more notable zoonotic diseases, uh, what they are, how we can con contract them, uh, their symptoms and their treatments. And then finally, we're going to have a look at a changing environment. We're going to have a look at how global climates or even regional climates can affect these diseases and what it is we should be considering as we move forwards. So first, when does a rat become a pest? Well, a rat becomes a pest when it starts to do one of three things. It starts to cause distress, it can cause damage, or it can spread disease. Now, distress is fairly easily to rationalise. Um, rats and other arthropod pests can cause distress, they can cause psychological distress by simply being there, by infesting people's premises. Damage is quite easy to visualise at this point damage to structures, damage to electrical wiring, or you simply damage to food or stored products. Now disease, disease is one that we probably consider less often, and it probably should be one that we pay a bit more attention to, because there are a host of diseases associated with rodents that have the capacity to hurt us and to hurt the animals that we look after. So why should we worry about rodent diseases, as after all, we are not rodents? However, a zoonotic pathogen is a pathogen which can cause a disease to move between species. And rodents are capable of carrying a vast array of pathogens, many of which can be zoonotic. Now these zoonoses aren't just limited to human and rodent transfers, but also can affect the animals we care for, the animals we work with, and even in some instances, the animals that are destined to be food on our table. So diseases have been around for a long time. But it has to be said that the world has become a more sanitary place. Clean water, sewers, food hygiene standards, all of these things have come a long, long way in the last hundred years. But more recently, there's been a resurgence in concern over rodents and their ability to spread disease, both in the developed world and the developing worlds. A paper by Merberg outlined some of the causes for this, and these were such things as a changing climate can increase preferential living conditions for rodents. Coupled with the fact that the world's human population is growing rapidly, and thus we need more food in order to feed all of the humans there. And rodents are responsible for huge pre- and post-harvest losses, not just through the direct consumption of food, but through the contamination and the spoiling of the food that they don't eat. There is an increased risk of resistance to rodenticides, especially the first and the second generation rodenticides, and this therefore has reduced the efficacy and the flexibility of many rodent control programs. And finally, rodents still play an important role in spreading emerging and re-emerging zoonotic diseases. So rodent presence can have serious implications for public health and potentially hazardous as they amplify the pathogens from their own environment by forming reservoirs of zoonotic disease. So this was taken from a paper written by Webster and MacDonald in 95. And these guys, they did a survey of a farm where they assayed many of the rodents, if not all of the rodents they could find on this farm, and they 
counted the pathogen load, both ectoparasite, endoparasite, and microbial within these animals. And what they found actually was quite alarming. That every single animal that they assayed had one, if not more, you know, endoparasites, ectoparasites, or micro uh, microbes living within it. Now, if we have a look at this first list, simply the worms, the uh, worms that live within these rodents, they found a huge number of them. A and a huge number of rodents, you know, some of them were, were absolutely chocker with them. And the more alarming thing here is that many of these worms are actually directly transmissible to humans. If we go and have a look at the microbes within these rodents, we can actually see an even more alarming picture, and that was almost all of the bacterium found within these animals were zoonotic. They were able to infect humans. Almost half of the protozoa they found had the same mechanisms, and the viruses they found in there also had the capacity to move to humans. In fact, they found, even in the UK farms, evidence of Hantan virus in these animals, albeit at a very low level. So rats themselves are part of an ecosystem, and by that I mean ectoparasites that live on these animals uh, are bound in huge numbers. Fleas were on almost 100% of the rats that they assayed, mites on two-thirds of them, and lice on a further third. These animals themselves are known to be vectors of disease. Fleas can carry Yersinia pestis, which is responsible for the disease, the plague. Now, we might consider the plague to be confined to the animals of history, but in reality, it's still around today, and it still affects many countries around the world. There have even been some noticeable cases recently in the States, which have had Yersinia pestis, the plague, cropping up. So these, these diseases aren't just a problem elsewhere. They can very realistically be problems here in the UK, given the right environment and the right situations. So, you know, with that in mind, why should we be, why should we be worrying? Well, disease has a very obvious negative impact on health, and sadly there's a clear correlation between the susceptibility to diseases and experiencing exaggerated effects from them in those people who are either elderly, young, vulnerable, or pregnant. So with that comes a socio-economic impact as well, because there's an increased load on the National Health Service, not to mention the fact that there is a clear correlation between instances of these diseases and a national increase in the number of sick days taken as a result of them. So as members of the public health pest industry, we have to be responsible for safeguarding public health, because our actions have the capacity to increase the health and the well-being of society by decreasing the opportunity for these diseases to be transmitted. So how do these diseases get from them to us? I've mentioned this term a couple of times now, zoonosis, and what zoonosis means is it's the ability for a disease to move from one animal to another. But all animals have diseases that are specific to them. It's unlikely that you're going to be able to give your cold to your dog. However, it's equally unlikely that your dog will give you kennel cough. But there are several diseases which are capable of jumping this species barrier. And these diseases are what we refer to as zoonotic diseases. And these diseases can be very dangerous for several reasons. Firstly, they can be extremely difficult to track and control. If you take, for example, the patterns of migratory birds, which can carry and transmit different forms of influenza, it can be very difficult to actually accurately determine where birds will start and where they will ultimately end up. In the same vein, very cryptic animals such as rodents can infest properties, they can infest environments, without us necessarily being aware of them, sometimes for a substantial amount of time. This means that during that period of time where they are undetected, they have the capacity to be spreading the disease, which can move on to us despite us not knowing that they're there. Now, sometimes when diseases jump to a new host, it can become more lethal as it's unable to function correctly, and these complications can inadvertently increase their lethality. It's been documented several times where a disease in a primary host has little to no effect to that host animal, but as soon as it jumps that zoonotic barrier, as soon as it jumps to a secondary host, such as a human being, it's unable to function, and as a result, the secondary host, us, ends up suffering, sometimes significantly, as a result of that. So let's have a look at some other terminologies.
Vectors. Now, vectors can be either biological or mechanical, and biological vectors can be instances such as the bite of an arthropod, within which that disease is still growing. Now, mechanical vectors are when the disease or the pathogen is carried around on that animal, and it's physically moved through the contact with its feet, fur, or cuticle. It's important to note that with mechanical vectoring, that pathogen is not necessarily growing or multiplying. It's simply being moved from one situation, one location, to another. Food and waterborne pathogens can harbor within the food and water, sometimes for extended periods of time. And if food is not treated properly prior to being consumed, then that pathogen may then infect a new host. We can have direct contact with animals carrying these diseases. And these are instances where you have two host species coming into direct contact with one another, usually through bites or scratches, or through contact with bodily fluids and excreta. You can have indirect contact as well. And these are instances where the two host species are separated by an intermediary, such as surfaces and objects, uh, upon which these pathogens have been deposited. Think, therefore, of chicken coops, animal building, or livestock watering and feeding stations, and even objects such as keyboards and office equipment. Uh, an example of this would be um, a, a can of fizzy drink. And the last time you drank a can of fizzy drink, uh, did you wipe the top of the ring pull, the, the, the part which you depress into the center of the can? Probably not. Now imagine there that that can has been stored in a warehouse or an environment which has had an active population of rodents. Those rodents have been moving over the tops of those cans, they've been moving around them, they have been depositing urine, potentially feces or saliva or other bodily fluids on top of that can. And then they have left, potentially without leaving any trace of their being there. However, that urine, that saliva, is still there, it's still present, and it has the capacity to potentially be harboring pathogens and disease. You then receive the can, you depress the ring pull, and you take a drink without a second thought. You are therefore then coming into indirect contact with that rodent and have a capacity to take on the diseases that it's carrying. So let's have a look at some of these mechanisms in a little bit more detail. Obviously, the most obvious is the direct action between wild rodents acting as a reservoir disease and coming into direct contact with human beings and passing on these diseases either through bites or scratches or through mishandling of them. We can then have a look at infected rodents coming into contact with inanimate objects, inert objects, and urinating on food, preparation services, or other equipment that we may use. And therefore, when we come into indirect contact with rodents through these contact, uh, contaminated food surfaces and foods, then we have the capacity to be taking those diseases onto ourselves. This can also happen through livestock and domestic animals, where they also come into contact with either urine or feces of that animal, or come into direct contact with rodents themselves. And then humans come into, again, indirect contact with these rodents, but through contact with these animals, either through direct contact with the animals or the food that they may one day become. The final route, of course, would be infected rodents and then their ecology, the arthropods, the fleas, the lice, the mites, the ticks that live on these animals, then coming into direct contact with human being. And the disease is then transferred to humans through the bites of these arthropods. So you're having a direct contact with the arthropods and an indirect contact with the rodents that may be the reservoir for these diseases. So we really need to be focusing, as the pest control industry, probably on four high-risk uh, opportunities for infection. Firstly, contact with urine and feces, especially if that urine or feces is fresh. The fresher it is, the more likely it is to be able to harbor these diseases. Inhalation of dust is probably one that we don't consider as often as we probably should. Dust particles are able to carry pathogens on them, and when they are disturbed, either through us moving by them, moving through them, or trying to clear them away, there's the capacity for us to inhale that dust and also inhale the pathogens that are carried on it. Bites and scratches, both by rodents and arthropods, are a key risk when we talk about the transference of disease from one host to another. 
It also has to be noted that rodents don't necessarily have to be alive in order to scratch you. Rodent paws are incredibly sharp, and they will have almost certainly urine and other excreta caught up and bound under their nails. And so handling dead animals incorrectly or without the certain and due respect that they deserve can result in scratches and abrasions which can then transfer those diseases onto you despite that animal being perished. And of course, as we mentioned before, the ingestion of contaminated food and water is a key mechanism by which these diseases can get to us. In all of these cases, however, the risk of disease transmission increases with an increased exposure. Changes in human and animal behaviours will therefore increase this exposure risk. To put some of these things into context, we can have a look at things like seasonal changes. Now, seasonal changes can affect human behaviour. For example, when it becomes sunny outside or when it becomes uh, pleasant outside, human beings are more likely to go and explore the wilderness. And this has the capacity to bring us closer to rodents by taking us into the territory of wild rodents. However, this also works the other way, which is many farming practices are driven by the seasons. And with that, the bringing in of crops or the storing of cereal foods will draw rodents in from the wilderness and it will draw rodents into areas of human habitation. And therefore, we are bringing the disease risk closer to human beings and increasing the potential for exposure between rodents and humans. Food storage and food manufacturing processes have changed dramatically over the last several decades. And with that, probably a good example would be the increase in the number of free-range poultry farms. Now, free-range poultry farms uh, allow, rodents, uh, allow poultry a much higher degree of freedom. They allow them to roam. And it also increases their ability to come into contact with other animals, such as wild birds and wild mammals changes in human behavior. Now, if COVID has shown us nothing, it is the startling changes in human behavior that can occur under exceptional circumstances. Now with COVID, you know, certain disease transmission risks have increased, certain have decreased, but all of this goes to show how even the smallest change in human behavior can dramatically alter um, how we function in society and how we interact with each other and even inanimate objects. And finally, we can have a look at an increase in population density. The world's population is increasing, but with that, we are slowly moving towards nebula of population densities, population hubs, where before you might have an instant or a hotspot in a city where you have an outbreak of a disease. The exposure risk may have been relatively small as the population density was relatively low. However, as the population density increases, the potential for interaction and exposure to that hotspot increases as the population density itself will increase. So we're going to have a look now at some commonly encountered diseases. All this information is taken from the HSE guidance documents and a very good paper written by James Fox called Diseases Transmitted by Man's Worst Friend, the Rat. So we shall look firstly at salmonosis. Salmonosis is caused by the salmonella bacteria, a gram-negative aerobic bacteria that's readily found in the feces of infected animals. Now, as well as being a serious contamination risk, salmonella strains were at one time actually used as a form of rodent control. However, they rapidly established that in areas where they were using salmonella as a mechanism to control rodents, there were also sporadic outbreaks of salmonellosis. And sadly, in certain instances, these outbreaks were so severe that it actually resulted in a loss of life. And as such, the product um, and use pattern of using salmonella to control rodents was withdrawn. Now, the transmission, as I said before, is through feces. And feces and contamination on food is a high risk transmission factor. However, it's been more and more noted that infections may be acquired through direct contact with animals themselves. Rats infected with salmonella are commonly reported and commonly um, found in areas located around farms, so they can become a part of the problem from the very first instance from the field to the fork of our food production um, tra chains. Rat feces themselves can remain infective for 148 days when maintained at room temperature. So given the ideal conditions, um, rodent feces and rodent droppings can actually cause salmonosis 
even if that population is even transitory or has already been controlled. So some of the symptoms, well, the clinical signs of salmonosis in humans include the following, an acute and sudden gastroenteritis leading to abdominal pains, diarrhea, nausea, fever. And although most of these cases are self-limiting, more severe clinical diseases have been documented. As I said before, there have even been documented cases of mortality as a result of salmonosis. However, recovery and cure is quite easy to manage. And with careful management, usually just um, fluids and electrolyte balances mean that you don't require any antimicrobial therapy or intervention. In fact, they've actually found in some studies that humans, the antimicrobial therapy or the, um, may even prolong the length of time that salmonella remains in the system. And in one double blind study, they found that oral antibiotics did not in fact significantly affect the duration of salmonella catch. So with that in mind, Let's move on to the next one, Hantan virus. So Hantan viruses are from the Birinaviridae family and are a group of viruses that are normally carried by rodents such as rats, mice and voles. Uh, and it must be noted at this point that actually each species of rodents tends to carry a different strain or a different species of the virus and that can have a different and differing effects dependent on the host animal and the recipient host animal. Um, they are present throughout the world and they can cause a range of diseases in humans and these diseases can present from mild flu-like illnesses all the way to severe respiratory illnesses or even hemorrhagic diseases. Old world Hanton viruses are those mostly present in Europe, Asia and Africa and they tend to cause hemorrhagic and kidney diseases. New world Hanton viruses tend to cause severe respiratory disease. The transmission is through the urine, saliva and feces and Sol Hanton virus is probably one of the most widely distributed and it's found in rodents across the world. Now, as mentioned before, the actual symptoms of the disease or the disease itself um, depends largely on the animal from which it was caught. But they do tend to present in two serious infections in humans, either hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome or Hantan pulmonary syndrome. People infected tend to exhibit a range of illnesses. Uh, said before, like a nonspecific influenza episode to acute renal insufficiency and hemorrhagic disease. Hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome is probably the most common of these two diseases and it's characterized by fever, headaches, myalgia and hemorrhagic manifestations which can lead to shock from massive capillary leakage. So what can be done if contract and contracting he uh, Hantan virus? Well, the incubation period is generally from two to four weeks but it can be as little as two days uh, and anything up to eight weeks at this point. The severity of the disease depends, as I mentioned before, on the species or the strain of Hantan virus contracted. Now, Hantan viruses themselves can be very deadly. Um, they can have a mortality rate, if left untreated, of up to 15%. And there is no effective antiviral treatment at present, so therefore the only treatment that you can receive for this is supportive. It's to control the fevers, it's to control these symptoms, uh, or to provide dialysis and allow the body then to be able to fight and mitigate that disease. Rat bite fever. So there are several bacterial pathogens that have been isolated from rat bites, with these two being the most commonly micro, uh, mi isolated microorganisms. Now, the transmission, therefore, is mostly or most often through the bite of an infected rat. However, it must be noted that these bacterium are present all through the oral cavity and the upper respiratory tract of rodents, which usually are asymptomatic, so they show no evidence of the disease themselves. So exposure to rat saliva without an overt bat rat bite can be a possible transmission route from rodents to human beings. One survey in America, in fact, indicated that as many as four out of every six rodents surveyed carried one, if not more, of these bacteria within their saliva. So what are the symptoms? Well, despite there being several strains of this bacteria, the rat bite fever causes a range of symptoms which are common to both variants. Fever, chills, myagma, rash and arthritis, and a, a swelling or a aching within the joints.
what can be done if you suspect you've got rat bite fever? Well, rat bite fever usually has a mortality of around 13% if it's left untreated. However, if it's caught early, then it can be treated with antibiotics. But it must be noted that as this disease progresses, it becomes progressively more problematic. And so in order to try and correctly treat it, it must be identified and picked up very, very rapidly. Lastly, we'll look at leptospirosis. Now, leptospirosis is probably one of the most commonly widespread zoonotic diseases. It's found in almost all mammals around the world. However, it must be noted that rodents are probably the only major species that can shed leptospirosis within their urine uh, all throughout their lifespan without ever showing any clinical manifestations of having the disease at all. The transmission, therefore, is usually from contact with infected urine. However, this urine can become embedded in dust particles and it can be inhaled if that dust is then moved or it could be inhaled if aerosolized during site cleaning and treatments. Skin abrasions and exposure to mucous membranes may also serve as a point of entry into human beings. So realistically, all secretions and excretions from inf infected rodents should be considered infective. What are the symptoms? Well, the disease can actually vary from, you know, a very unassuming uh, infection to fairly severe infections, and even in some cases, death. Infected individuals show a biphasic disease, which means that the disease will present in two stages, the first of which the patient will become suddenly ill with weaknesses, headaches, mild malaise, chills, fevers. But as it progresses, you can get conjunctal conjunctal suffocation, which can lead to the appearance of jaundice, and upon examination by medical professionals, they can discover whether there is renal, hepatic, pulmonary, or even gastrointestinal abnormalities, of which many of these in the advanced stages will be presenting. So what is the treatment, therefore? Well, because there are many different strains of leptospirosis, the specific treatment regimes can vary and an incorrect diagnosis can potentially lead to complications within this treatment. Antibiotics will need to be administered as soon as possible and treatment becomes progressively more complex with an increase in time. It must also be noted that with several of these diseases, it's very common to have several overlapping conditions or symptoms, especially overlapping symptoms and conditions with the current COVID-19 pandemic. So it's very, very important that you are aware of what you do and if you ever develop any of these symptoms to inform medical professionals specifically that you deal with rodents and have the capacity to be infected or exposed to these diseases. But it's not all about us. I've mentioned four fairly prevalent uh, diseases throughout Europe and the UK. But it's not just about human beings as public health pest controllers. We also have to look at the animals that we look after as well. And within this, I'm going to have a look at avian flu. So avian flu is obviously, you know, influenza carried by birds and usually transmitted from birds to other birds. Um, but a study done by Francesca Velkers showed that rodents could be a significantly underestimated mechanism of transmission within this. Although most farms have very high levels of biosecurity, there is of course the unavoidable risk of exposure, especially in poultry industry where we have a greater degree of freedom with these animals. Yet even inside the very biosecure units, we were finding instances of avian flu still occurring. And studies have shown that avian flu is capable of being mechanically vectored by rodents in their fur. These rodents coming into infected birds, infected wild birds, outside of the poultry houses, either by coming into direct contact with them, their feces, or drinking from communal drinking areas. These animals would then migrate or move inside the poultry houses, carrying the avian flu on their fur and infecting animals in highly biosecure units. This means that regardless of the preventative or the procedural safeguards in place on these farms, if they didn't have a good enough pest control program or they had no pest control program in place, then they had significantly high instances of livestock-based diseases as a result of that. So the future of disease, changes in global climate. 
The UK is very fortunate at present that it has a relatively low pressure from zoonotic diseases, but this could very easily change. I'm going to give you now a case study of Toxoplasmosis gondii uh, and how the effects of climate have altered the shift in movement of this um, Toxoplasmosis throughout Europe. Now, Toxoplasmosis is a very good case study because it has a relatively uh, complicated life cycle. It starts within cats uh, and then is shed within cat feces, where it's then picked up by rodents and birds and then moves into their tissues, only to be then re-ingested by the cat or a new cat, and the cycle therefore continues. However, it's able to jump from this cycle uh, and it can move into livestock, which also come into contact with fecal cysts, or they come into contact with rodents and birds if they consume them. It can also exist outside of a host animal for a considerable period of time, and so can contaminate feed and water as well. Both of these, the contamination of water and the existence of cysts within livestock, can therefore get into the human food cycle, and we can therefore become exposed to and get Toxoplasmosis gondii as a result of this. So where does the climate come into all of this then? Well, with every environmental change, whether occurring naturally or through human intervention, changes in the ecosystem and the balances within that will increase or decrease the survivability of hosts and vectors, how they breed, develop, and how they move. Pathogen survival can be affected by environmental changes. Increased precipitation, for example, increases the amount of time that Toxoplasmosis gondii is available outside of a host body and therefore can more easily spread itself throughout an environment. So therefore, a change in climate can help move this disease outside of a host, but also a change in climate can influence the ecology of the hosts. Um, a change in climate can increase the number of rodents or it can encourage pest species to migrate from one region to another or become more or less prevalent and therefore you can see that ultimately changes in global and regional climates can result in the ability for diseases and their vectors to become more widespread. So what can we do in the short term? Well firstly we can put a barrier between ourselves and these diseases and we can use that barrier in the form of PPE. And choosing the correct PPE for the task is incredibly important, especially when we must be mindful of these invisible routes of transmission. As we mentioned before, the indirect routes of transmission, such as contamination of surfaces, can be uh, an invisible risk. Uh, and it's all well and good wearing your gloves when you are handling rodents or handling bait, but even so much as handling boxes that are considered to be new but have been left on site may very well at that point harbour these diseases. And so it's important to not just wear the correct PPE, but wear it at the correct times as well. This is especially important when we talk about the inhalation of dust, because be mindful of the pathogens it can hide in that dust. And you don't have to be doing a cleaning job, but you may be just moving through that dust, disturbing it and moving it into the air. And that pathogen can then move and migrate into your lungs. Disinfect, therefore, where possible. Disinfectment treatments can therefore reduce the risks of disease transfer by reducing our exposure to them. Animal contact is another big thing. Reduce your contact with animals both alive and dead. If you can, use mechanical aids to move animals from one location to disposal and dispose of bodies correctly. As I mentioned before, animals can still cause scratches and abrasions even when they have perished. And even dead bodies can still harbour diseases for a significant period of time after that animal has passed away. So disposal of the bodies correctly is a, an important factor within controlling disease and clean workwear. Now, workwear can harbour pathogens and transfer them between your sites. And by that, I don't mean necessarily the workwear which you consider to be PPE, but maybe the workwear that you consider to be your uniform or your daily clothes. These can harbour pathogens and transfer them. And when I say between sites, I don't necessarily just mean between jobs. I mean between jobs and your own home. So therefore, it's important to consider your workwear as you would consider your PPE and take the same mitigations as you would do when you are cleaning it. So what can be done long term? Well, first off, we can have a better understanding and a better communication between ourselves and the public to 
educate the public on what it is that we are doing and how it is that we are providing a service. We are providing this aegis, this shield between us and them and rodents and disease. We need to decrease the amount of waste we are producing as a society. This waste not only harbors pathogens and diseases, but it also increases the amount of pests and the pest pressure in a certain environment. And if you have a combination of both disease and pest, then those pests, as we mentioned before, will vector this disease away from these sites of waste into other areas nearby. We need to have a better surveillance of the diseases and how they are moving around in society and within rodents, within humans and with the animals that we look after. A better surveillance will only help us better forecast and trend where these diseases are and how we can better treat them. And finally, training and implementation. We need to know what to do and we need to know when to do it. And most often we need to know what we need to do and we need to implement it as soon as is possible. It's this reduction in time to action will reduce the amount of time that we are exposed or other people are exposed to these pathogens. And with that reduction in exposure comes a greater degree of safety as a result. Now, I apologize, it's been all too short, but if you have any further questions, uh, I'll be doing a short Q&A after this. And if I'm not doing the Q&A, then you can always drop me an email to alex at Wade Environmental. Thank you ever so much and enjoy the rest of your day.